so glad to have each and every one of you here with us uh, tonight, and especially those who are visiting, and uh, we hope that you have a good rest of your week. <clears throat> We're going to uh, jump right into the rest, uh, the next lesson as we study through this, uh, the book of Acts in this uh, series. We're going to pick up at the end of chapter 4, the last section starting in verse 32, and it's at the end of chapter 4 that we see a church what? What key word might you use to describe the church that we read about in Acts 4, 32 through 37? How would you describe them in a, in a word, a couple of words? Huh? They're on fire. On fire? Yeah. We can put a hyphen in there. Yeah. On fire. Yeah. <laughs> Good. What else? What else might describe the church? Huh? A flame. Yeah, there you go. Well, <clears throat> all of one heart. Yeah, very good. Very good. Inspired. Okay. Zealous. Good. Brother Dwight? Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Unified, I thought of unified. We see all of that describes what we see about the church, right? <clears throat> uh, somebody read verse 32 for us. Wonderful. Just a beautiful picture of the Lord's church. So let me ask this question that we have up here, what church were people added to in the New Testament? What? Huh? The church? Yeah. Yeah, the church Jesus established. Yeah. Any other answers? In other words, no one in the New Testament who ever became a Christian was anything but a what? A Christian. It's really that simple. Uh, everyone who became a Christian was simply added to the Lord's church. They were simply Christians. And so <clears throat> we learn this when we read the Bible, when we read Acts, we learn that the New Testament only knows of one church. Because denominations, divisions, breaking off different groups simply did not exist. They just weren't there. There was only one church to be a part of. There weren't options. And at the time, it was only the group there in Jerusalem where we're at right there in the book of Acts. Yes, sir. Yeah. Because Paul himself later on says, I persecuted this way to death. Yeah. Yeah, and, and most, if not all, translations will capitalize the word way. I think they take it from Jesus' own words. He said, I'm the way. Yeah. I think they just they try to make it a sect. Yeah. Uh huh. You know, rather than a true uh, existence of Jesus. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you brought that up, I am the way, because we're going to see a, a, a different reference to that same verse, John 14, 6, a little bit later. Uh, Brother J.N. Armstrong called this undenominational Christianity. You ever heard that term? We've heard non-denominational, but he called it undenominational. Why un? Is it because... There wasn't any. It was, it was undenominational. Uh, in his book, Undenominational Christianity, which was first published in 1913, and I have a copy, you can still buy them, he wrote this. The world today practically knows nothing of undenominational Christianity. For many the idea that a person can be only a Christian is hard to accept. 
As soon as one affirms that he is a Christian, the invariable question is, to what denomination do you belong? In other words, we can't stand it just to say, I'm a Christian. And yet what we read in the New Testament, in fact, they're not even called that yet, are they? They're followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. So that's why we need to understand that our name, that when we say our name, the churches of Christ or the church of Christ, we're not talking about a denomination. So we have to use it correctly. We're simply talking about what? people who follow Jesus, right? That's, that's what we're saying when we say the church of Christ, okay? It simply means the church that belongs to Jesus, the people who belong to Jesus, follow his teachings, no more, no less. And as Brother Armstrong wrote that in 1913, it's still true today. We don't like it when he's different. you're a Christian, yeah, but what kind? And yet, we've got to perpetuate that, that I'm just a Christian. And you can be too. You don't have to be some other kind because you don't find that kind in Scripture. Okay, now why is this a great opportunity for us today? I think this is a great opportunity for us today. Why is that, if, if you agree that it is? Okay. Yeah. What do you mean? Just be a Christian. That kind of sounds appealing to a lot of people. Did you know that it doesn't always look like it if you when you see a big building, I'm not saying anything wrong with a big building or a large crowd, I'm not saying anything wrong with that at all. But it doesn't always appear to our eyes as we drive down the road or look on YouTube or something that denominationalism numbers are in decline, but they are. They, they actually are, are by their own numbers and they admit it. And that's talked about in Christendom, the decline of denominationalism. Okay. People are beginning to say, I, I don't know. I don't want that. I, I'm, I kind of just want, uh, you know, something there, there's, there, there really is a search for authenticity, and I, th I think most are trying to provide that, that feel in some way. But there's this pulling away from the institution or the, the big name or the brand. And so there's an opportunity for those who just say, hey, let's just try being a Christian. Let's see what, that, what that's like. How about that? Let's talk about that. Now, what, what I think is the secret is, of course, following Jesus' teachings, but if we will focus on providing uh, good worship, and I don't mean this in a, in, a, uh, in a wrong way, like we're just producing a product, but if we're be serious about good worship, right? Good preaching and teaching, and good worship fellowship. What difference do those things make? Those things, that's, that's what people are looking for. I can go and, man, I can be lifted up and just blown away by the worship. Man, these people mean this. These people are worshiping. And, and when it's time to pray, they're praying. When it's communion, you look at them and like, they seem like they're really focused on what this is about. And, 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 and the, the teaching and preaching is good. I'm learning. I'm being challenged and encouraged and built up. And I'm not just getting stories. Nothing wrong with stories. But I'm, I'm getting, I feel like I'm getting the word of God. I'm getting to know Jesus. I'm being challenged in my faith. And man, those people just seem to love me. And they don't care. They don't care about, you know, I walked off the street and they welcomed me in. Or they saw that I had a need and they cared for me. Or... You know, whatever the story might be, uh, uh, Matt, I think, not well, a little while ago, had a had a friend or family friend come and visit, 
And this, I know, is not the only time this has been true of this church, but it's a story I remember, and maybe within the last year or so. And the guy was very friendly, very nice, easy to talk to, uh, but had tattoos on his arms and stuff, and, and just like always, everybody just talking to him, making him feel at home, happy to meet him and get to know him. Matt told me later that that made such an impression on him because he walked into a church and maybe he wasn't used to being in a church environment. And what's on his mind how people might treat him? They look at my arms and they might not like that. I, I, you know, And yet that's not the reception that he got. Whether you agree or disagree with tattoos, that doesn't matter. That's potentially a lost soul that needs to find Christ who needs to be loved on by the people who love Jesus. Okay. Now, um, the opportunity lies then in the church being what we read that the church was like at the end of chapter 4, right? That's who we're supposed to be. All right, now let's turn to chapter 5. In verses 1 through 11, what is the problem in the story of Ananias and Sapphira? What's the problem? Greed, okay. Pride. Pride. Lying. Was I, was, was there something else said? Greed, pride, lying, uh, deception. So uh, the Bible, what verse do you see? It's early on. What verse tells us a specific thing? Of course, there's some underlying things. Greed and pride would certainly be there. But what word does Luke give us early on? Dwight says verse 3. What word do you see? Brother Dwight. To lie. Yeah. So their greed caused them to lie, but they lied, right? And that's what Peter called them out on. Um, now, why do you think this problem, you know the story, why do you think this problem arose in the church at this early stage? People, yeah, that'll do it every time, right? <laughs> every time, that'll do it. Uh, what, what else? I heard somebody else start coming. Yeah, and their greed might have been their motivation and pride. Hey, I don't want to come back and retract what I said. I want people to think I'm giving a certain amount, but I really, you know, decide I want to keep some of that. But it's interesting that this is happening early on. Of course, people are in it. Peter, I mean, uh, yeah, Peter in his words gives us the answer. Why has... So what does that tell us? From day one, essentially, who's at work? When God is at work, who is also at work? Satan's at work, too. What did we see in chapter uh, 3? In chapter 3, Peter speaks in Solomon's portico, and... The Sadducees didn't like it, did they? They didn't like that this lame man had been healed. And so Satan has already attacked the church from where? The outside, right? And now we get to chapter 5 and he's attacking from where? The inside. If I can't get them from the outside... I know I can sure get them from the inside. Isn't that what usually causes the division in the church? It's not the persecution from the outside, which tends to make us unified and strong and huddle together and say, go team, right? Hoorah. 
but it's when it's from the inside we get fractured and divided and 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 messed up. So and Satan knows exactly what to do, and uh, so I think that's that's a that's a an important thing that we see. Of course, Satan continues to attack from both both areas uh, always. But why did God? Why do you think God responded so severely? I mean, doesn't that just seem like God? That's a little over the top. You know, did you have to go that far? You ever wondered that? Why do you think he responded so severely? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's a good point because Satan certainly was attacking at the heart of the individuals and the church in its infancy. Yeah. Part of his attack stood out to me was just he's really pulling us back to the Holy Spirit, it seems like. And so if I can imagine you know, sort of <clears throat> two sides of the same fence, the Holy Spirit just kind of comes right in and starts saying, you know, you do what this assignment is. Yeah, that's a good point. That, that that Luke tells us, well, Peter's words are, you've lied against the Holy Spirit. Now, in the next verse or a couple of verses down, maybe with Sapphira, he mentions lied against God. So we see this kind of the Godhead represented there. But he, he mentions the Holy Spirit. And he says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. Because we've already seen from the beginning of Acts, and, 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 John, and John records Jesus said the Holy Spirit was coming, that the Holy Spirit was going to be the one of the Godhead after Jesus returned to heaven who would be the one directly involved in the work here, right? And that's interesting that we, that we see that. Yeah, Natalie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, neat that you brought that up because that's, that's what I uh, read in my study as well. And, the, and, and one person pointed out that God was taking sin seriously, especially at this, the infancy of the church, and throughout history, going back to the Old Testament, we see that God would do this at certain times when there was this new level of relationship and things were progressing with his people. And so some examples are Nadab and Abihu at the institution of the priesthood. I mean, they had already been trained. They had been taught what to do. And they said, oh, and God said, okay, it's time to to." to do this for the first time and they do it wrong on purpose and he strikes them dead okay yes sir go ahead Yeah. Planned deception. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. And that gets at the heart, doesn't it? It's very much a heart issue. Yeah. 
Yeah, good point. We see Achan, Joshua 7, who, who saw all that good stuff and said, hmm, I could use some of that, right? Kept it, whole family. Uh, Uzziah or Uzziah, now I forget. Is it Uzziah or did I write it wrong? Um, uh, Uzziah, and what was, what was his, what happened with him? Why was he put to death? Yeah, this was at a key point when God was going to renew their covenant un- with them under David's leadership. Okay? Yes. And there's key times in his infinite wisdom, he knows it's got to be this severe. Okay? This is at the threshold of the Christian age. This is right here at the the turn of things. Jesus is gone and the church is being launched. God is taking this seriously. Okay? Uh, So is the fear of God important? (laughs) Yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Take him at his word and take it seriously. Yeah, how so? Well, Making a point to Satan. That oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, very good. Spiritual warfare. Here's some thoughts real quick, uh, we'll move on, uh, that I put about uh, the f- why the fear of God is important. We see it in verses 5 11, and 11, don't we? 5 and 11 of Acts chapter 5. When they, it happened after, after both times, but the church was full of fear when this happened. And then in verse 11 we learn that the church was, uh, you know, they were fearful because of this, but also those who heard about it, everyone else who heard what happened, meaning those outside of the church. Word would have spread quickly. There was great fear that gripped them. That's a good thing. We could use a healthier dose, probably most of us, of fear, proper fear of God. Not that he's an ugly monster, not that he's uh, Jason or Freddy Krueger or one of those, you know, monsters on TV, but fear, respect, reverence, awe. I should fear him when I realize who he is. This is God. There should be fear. When people saw angels, what did they do? They didn't think about it. They just, they fell to the ground instantly in fear. We just can't really comprehend that. But we need a fear of God. So here's a couple of thoughts. We should fear him because he's God. Deuteronomy 6, verse 2 and 5, we should both fear him and love him. First of all, he says that Israelites, you're to fear me. Then in verse 5, he says, love the Lord your God. Fear and love go together, we see in Scripture, when it comes to our feelings towards God. The sinner should fear God's judgment. The Christian should fear God's displeasure. You see, I should be motivated to keep from sin by both my love for God, who he is and what he's done for me. And that gets most of our emphasis, and and perhaps rightly so. But we can't forget that another thing that ought to motivate me to live right is a healthy dose of fear of God because of who he is. Yep. 
Yep. And you and you love him. But when you see that belt, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I think that's probably our best way to relate to that concept is is uh, a father or a parent. <clears throat> okay, let's move to verses 12 through 16. This is a little quicker. Somebody read verses 12 through 16 for us, please. Okay, very good. This Solomon's portico, Jesus taught there. It's a kind of an outdoor porch area uh, that um, was there at the temple. On one side of the temple, it was a big, just outdoor pavilion area that had a roof over it, and that seems to be where they were meeting a lot of times, where the apostles were going and doing their teaching, and then we can tell they were also going out into the town among people to heal. But verse 13 is really kind of, uh, uh, it, it's a difficult verse. It, it, we're not, uh, you know, we wonder, well, what does that mean? Uh, verse 13, look at it. Luke says, none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Why, what does that mean? None of the rest dared join them. Dared, why would they not join them, and who is them? Well, that's, remember, that's where they got arrested last time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's the religious leaders, and all their spies that were out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, and that is along the lines of what I think is the explanation of this verse, uh, the apostles would go there to teach and preach. None of the rest, look at verse 14, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord. Believers. Go back to verse 13, none of the rest. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So a Christian, but said, "I'm going to kind of keep my distance. I don't know what might happen, and I'm, I'm not like the apostles." Yeah, didn't have those gifts, and that certainly could be, certainly could be the case. Um, there's question about it. There's people on different sides. Where I land on it is. I, th I think it's referring to, and I don't think it's a big, huge deal, but it's just interesting, and I think it's a curious verse to, to try to make sense of. But none of the rest, in, in my view, is more likely those who were not yet Christians, but watching, listening, observing at, at a distance, they were there in the temple area. They might have been later on. It says that uh, many of the priests became Christians. And there was persecution. There was great fear. I don't, not, I don't, I'm not sure about this yet, but I'm kind of watching it. What did you, you say? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, or afraid of persecution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, we think about people today. There's reasons that people are like, "Yeah, I hear you, and I love that," but you know, they're just not ready yet to to become a Christian, to take that step in faith, right? So, uh, not a huge deal, but I think that's it. But what does it say? The people held them in high esteem. They had respect and high regard for the apostles and uh, by association, the church. And then more than ever, believers, in other words, those that were like, okay, I believe, they were being added to the church, meaning they were obeying the gospel, multitudes of both men and women, Okay. And so what happens, what happens, uh, it seemed like every time in Jesus' ministry and in Acts, every time people start responding to the gospel, what happens? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here come the religious leaders and their jealous. That's the word Luke uses. He says they were jealous. Look at this. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that's the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy. And they arrested all the apostles. Now that had to be scary for those Christians. All the apostles get arrested. They, call, they put them in jail uh, an angel lets them out. Let me reference what Brother Gary brought up in verse 20. They, the angel lets them out, and what does the angel tell them to do? It's a, it's a unique thing he told them to go and do. What does he say? It's the way he words it. Look at verse 20. And say what? Yeah, all the words of this life capitalize, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This life, this life y'all are talking about. And we don't have time to look at all the scriptures, but if you go back to Acts chapter 1, one of the things they've been emphasizing is the resurrection of Jesus. They've been talking about Jesus is alive, believe in him for eternal life. And then they call the apostles before them, and they tell them, stop talking about this life. Angel lets them out. They realize they're, they're out there preaching and teaching again. They call them before the council. And again, Peter and the apostles, they talk about uh, verse 29 uh, and 30. Jesus is alive. You killed him. God exalted him as leader or author or priest and savior and uh, prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. In other words, he's the source of life, not y'all. We're supposed to follow him, not y'all. And Gamaliel stands up. Some, we were talking about this earlier, Lee, in your comments, some, uh, there's some extra biblical material that, that suggests uh, Gamaliel may have become a Christian. Gamaliel is, was the top dog Pharisee and the one who trained Saul. I don't know exactly where Saul was right now. Was he? I don't, I don't know the timeline. But Saul may have been in the mix of all this. Maybe we can learn that. That would be interesting. Okay, but they... So Gamaliel convinces them... And they beat them, right? They have them flogged. Now, we don't know enough to know how many, they could determine how many lashes they were going to give them. But the way they did it is, it, as far as I can tell, would have been uh, perhaps similar to the way Jesus was flogged, but they would strap with leather, strap their arms to a post. They would strip them down to the waist so their 
back and chest was op- was bare, and they would take that three strips of leather, they might have had bone or metal pieces in there, and it would be determined how many times they would get struck, and uh, they're tied down, and they would strike them on the back, and sometimes they would also strike them on the chest. And it would leave some crippled. It might kill some people. So imagine the scene. Uh, That happens, verse 40, and when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And somebody read verse 49, 41. Somebody read verse 41. Luke doesn't even stop. He just keeps writing. What does verse 41 say? Okay. What was... They leave the council bleeding, torn open, in pain, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. Man. Makes us think of Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. What did Jesus say about persecution? What did he say? Count it all joy. And now they're living that. It was Peter who wrote about this in his letters. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16. He wrote about rejoicing when you suffer for your faith. Can you imagine Peter writing his letter, writing what we call 1 Peter 4, And as he's writing, might he have stopped and felt his own scars and remembered that day, the pain of that day, and the joy of that day that all 12 of them running out rejoicing. And it makes me think, worthy to suffer if I'm not suffering ever for Jesus is that saying something about my faith am I not pushing it enough am I not being bold enough like they prayed for and I don't have to worry about being beaten I probably just have to worry about being made to feel awkward, right? Maybe fired, depending on where you work, or loss of a friend. Worthy to suffer. What a wonderful thought. And we didn't get to 6, 1 through 7. I'll I'll try to grab that because I think that says something about service. I want to look at that. Uh, next week. So we'll pick up there at six, uh, beginning of chapter six. Thank you.